You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I am Paul Garner. And I am Todd Wood. Uh, It's great to have you here if you're a regular viewer and listener. And of course, we've also picked up quite a few uh, new uh, new viewers and listeners over the last uh, few weeks. So it's great to have you as well. And uh, we hope you'll enjoy the podcast and that you'll stick with us. Uh, Todd, um, since we last recorded an episode, um, you and I have both come down with various ailments. We've both had COVID and various uh, lingering symptoms from that. So... uh, but neither of us, I think, is sort of firing on all cylinders. So we, we hope today is going to go okay. But if people notice us kind of hacking and coughing, then that, that is the reason why. Um, but anyway. Uh, we'll try to I edit most of that bit- out. So we'll try to edit most of that out so you don't have to listen to us. But beware. <laughs> yeah, hope, hopefully the magic of post-production can sort of limit our, our coughs and, and, and so on. So anyway. Um, Today, we have got an uh, an exciting episode lined up. Uh, This is uh, another episode in our series, the third in our series, all about the flood post-flood boundary. So what uh, what we've been considering in this series is where does the flood end in the geological record? So which rocks are flood rocks and which rocks were the ones that were laid down after the flood? And as we've said in previous episodes, uh, although this might sound one of those sort of intramural kind of topics between, you know, creationists who are immersed in, in all of the details, actually, it's a really important topic in creationism because it has all kinds of uh, impacts on, on uh, other questions in creationism, uh, questions about how much diversification there was. Uh, within the ark kinds when they when they came off the ark and how much post flood catastrophism there was and yeah, lots of other questions and it it really is a crucial part of developing a, a coherent flood model so this is actually a very important topic and uh, in line with the ethos of our podcast which I'm sure viewers and listeners are now very familiar with um, we wanted to focus on the positive arguments. Uh, relating to this debate about uh, the flood post flood boundary, we, what we could have done is we we could have just brought on two guests or more than two guests representing different positions and kind of yeah, yeah had, had a kind of slug had a kind of slug fest. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's not really our style. What we really wanted to do is to focus on the positives, uh, give people the opportunity to to present the best case that they could, and so. Uh, We did an introductory episode that um, listeners will remember where we talked about some of the history of how creationists have thought about this topic uh, over the years. And then we had an episode uh, last time with Dr. Tim Clary from the Institute for Creation Research, a geologist who presented um, one position, uh, his favoured position on the flood post-flood boundary, where he puts the uh, end of the flood quite high in the geological record, basically just below the Uh, ice age uh, deposits Uh, and then today we've got another guest and i'm delighted to say that we have dr marcus ross uh with us again um marcus is no stranger to uh viewers and listeners regular uh to the podcast because he's uh he's joined us for a number of other episodes to talk about other topics and today marcus is going to be presenting uh, a different position on the flood post-flood boundary so marcus uh it's really great to have you with us hey thanks for having me back all right i'm starting to add on like little stars or something like that for uh <laughs> yeah, that's <suggestion>. right. <laughs> yeah when you get five more, stars get you get time off for time off for good yeah behavior. yeah that's <laughs> right. That's right. after two more i think i get a free pizza at pizza hut Maybe, or something yeah. like that that's, that's an american <laughs> that's an american thing yeah 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 that's good and as our viewers and listeners will will note, um, you know, obviously with your scientific background, your academic background, again, um, you know, th- this is this is a topic that you can speak to with with some knowledge and experience, and it's a topic I know that you've you've written about. So, uh, so we, we we're going to be very interested to hear what you have to say about it. 
Uh, I, I wonder whether we could sort of begin our discussion then, Marcus, um, just by asking you to set out your position on the flood, post-flood boundary, because it's a bit different than the position that we heard last time from uh, Dr. Clary. So, yeah, just, just tell us what that position uh, is for, for a start. How do, how do you define uh, your position on the flood, post-flood boundary? I hold to a position that the end of the flood is somewhere at or a little bit above the uh, KPG boundary. So you hear me use that term. K stands for Cretaceous, comes from the, uh, the German word Krede, uh, which means chalk, because Cretaceous deposits are uh, frequently seen, or chalk is, is a frequent sediment that is found in Cretaceous um, materials. The PG stands for the Paleogene. Uh, this would have been termed uh, 15, 20 years ago, the KT boundary, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Um, and it's, it's been reformalized a little bit in the geological literature. So what does that mean? Basically, the end of the Cretaceous is the last remains of dinosaur-bearing rock units before you get into what is classically called the age of mammals, the Cenozoic. Um, and so my position is that uh, the end of the flood is probably at or nearby the, KTB, uh, the KPG boundary. Um, and uh, that's a position uh, historically that goes back at least into the 1990s. Uh, if not a little bit before, but kind of wasn't uh, talked about very much uh, in the 1980s, for example. So um, it's a position that isn't, uh, it doesn't trace back to, say, Whitcomb and Morris, like uh, Tim's position uh, will. You know, he's going to be able to say, hey, young Earth creationists have been looking at, say, something like a very high post flood boundary somewhere around just under the Ice Age. So that would be a Pliocene, Pleistocene uh, boundary in comparison. So for the folks that aren't familiar with geology, then, the KT boundary or KPG boundary is classically placed at 65, 66 million years ago. And the Pliocene Pleistocene would be somewhere around two, two and a half million years ago. So on the conventional time scale, this is a substantial amount of time. This is over 60 million years worth of difference. Um, and so for us in creationism, we're trying to figure out largely um, what is it that we do with the, the Cenozoic? Is the Cenozoic part of the flood? Or is the Cenozoic part of the post-flood? And that's, that's where this debate is kind of centered. Uh, those are the two broad camps. Again, there are some others out there, uh, but these are the ones that command the attention of, of uh, almost all the creation geologists out there. And when you refer to the Cenozoic, some people might you know, have heard that referred to um, as the tertiary um, as well. That's another term that people may have heard, an older term from the older literature. Um, yeah, so that's that's very very helpful. Um, when you say that we can trace this um, position back to the nineties, um, when was the first time really this was being proposed in the literature? You know, that's a that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure, but I have a book over here that I know both of you guys are very well familiar with, and that is mm -hmm. Steve Austin's uh, creation classic. Uh, Grand Canyon Monument to Catastrophe. Now, this was Austin et al. There was a, a bunch of different um, contributors to this. Uh, and this was published by the Institute for Creation Research in 1994. Um, and as I'm looking at it, there's a guy by the name of Marvin Ross who has uh, helped on this. No, no relation. But in 1994, uh, this, was, this was a big book for ICR because this was a fairly technical book um, it was one that uh, I picked up right away and, and devoured. It was really, really helpful. And it was the first time uh, that a group of young earth creationists, particularly young earth creationists in geology, sought to explain together a coherent picture of a region uh, geologically. Uh, this wasn't just a, a quick little paper. This is a substantial book with a lot of detailed geological observations and argumentation. And in this book, uh, if I can pull to the right page over here, they have a uh, diagram in which they lay out what they think are the flood rocks of the Grand Canyon uh, versus uh, the Creation Week rocks before them and the uh, post-flood rocks after them. What they did was say that um, the crystal and basement rocks in the Grand Canyon are Creation Week rocks. The vast majority of the layers that everybody goes to see in the Grand Canyon itself uh, were formed during the flood. Now, the canyon itself was formed after the flood, and there's some discussion about that too, because that's a uh, how that ends up happening is uh, a question um, 
that relates to the post-flood boundary? Do you think that uh, the Grand Canyon is being formed by receding floodwaters channelizing and carving out the Grand Canyon? Uh, that would be a position for, say, the higher post-flood boundary folks. Um, Steve Austin, on the other hand, had made an argument that, da- that uh, there were a series of lakes in the post-flood period uh, that had breached and carved the canyon. So he was looking at that and saying, there is a post-flood origin to the canyon itself, uh, even though there is a flood origin to the rocks that make up the majority of the canyon. Um, up above most of the rocks of the Grand Canyon uh, is the Wasatch Formation, or the Wasatch Formation. And it's a, a well-known um, extensive rock unit in uh, the Western US, uh, contains a lot of mammal fossils. And in this book, that is listed as post-flood. So um, that is part of the tertiary, that's part of the Cenozoic. And uh, so at least as far back as Grand Canyon Monument to Catastrophe, uh, we can see a very clear argument uh, being made by some creation geologists that um, much of the tertiary then uh, would be in the post-flood period. So 1994 was uh, a seminal year too, because for for the post-flood boundary argument, because it was in the same year uh, that catastrophic plate tectonics was proposed at the ICC, the International Conference on Creationism. And uh, that paper, uh, Steve Austin et al., there were six authors, uh, four of them geologists, uh, Steve Austin, John Baumgardner, um, Andrew Snelling and Kurt Wise were the geologists, along with Larry Vardaman and Russ Humphreys, uh, looking at synthesizing a concept of how the flood operated under a rapid plate tectonics mechanism. Uh, In that paper, um, which uh, was largely Kurt's uh, kind of finalized construction, uh, was an argument that the majority of the tertiary or Cenozoic uh, was formed post-flood. So that paper included a... uh, KPG boundary, a uh, Cretaceous tertiary uh, boundary. Uh, since that time, uh, John Baumgartner has disagreed uh, with that. He prefers a high post flood boundary. The remaining authors, to my knowledge, at least the geologists uh, on that, continue to favor uh, a KPG boundary on that. So those, those are some of the very early um, articles. I, I suppose you could go back to some of Steve Austin's earlier stuff on uh, the, the breach dam hypothesis. Uh, I'm not sure what he had written, particularly on that, because I haven't uh, looked those up recently. Um, but those would imply at least a, uh, a high post flood, ba- uh, sorry, a low post flood boundary compared to the Whitcomb Morris model. Um, and so it was rather interesting because uh, Steve's there, he's working at ICR. And I'm not entirely sure how much of his argumentation was recognized as kind of going against the Genesis flood uh, at the time. I know that CPT was not. Um, had its troubles uh, within ICR, and uh, the the authors actually had to put a disclaimer on their paper saying that while each of them had either works or had worked for ICR, this was not an ICR uh, statement uh, of any kind. So, so, you know, it is contentious and always has been uh, when we're looking at uh, issues of geology and creation. <laughs> always been a fractious group uh, about that. And and you're right. I mean, the, this whole debate about uh, the flood post flood boundary uh, is a very contentious one in in creationism, and it's why we wanted to kind of uh, deal with it in this series, but to try and do that in a kind of calm atmosphere where we could all we could all sort of be adults about it and present the best cases on on each side. So, uh, okay. Well, I'd like to kind of use that now to kind of move into a discussion of why. Uh, that's your preferred flood post flood boundary and uh really we we kind of gu- want to be guided by you here marcus so we want to just give you the opportunity to lay out for us some of the evidence some of the arguments that you think support a kpg um flood post flood boundary so why don't you kick us off with um some of the evidence that persuades you well thanks um I, there's a number of different evidences that I think help us uh, narrow down to a likelihood that uh, the KPG boundary is is at or near the end of the flood. Uh, thinking back of some of the things that were said in that um, CPT article that was published in twenty uh, sorry in uh, 1994, uh, 
Uh, they laid out a couple of different arguments in that. Uh, one of them is in the tertiary or the or the Paleogene, the Cenozoic, whatever terms we happen to be using for these, um, at least within North America, and and I'll, I'll at least point this out, is that a lot of the work has been done in North America because that's where most of the young Earth creationists are. And it's the the stuff that uh, they're most interested in. Um, the dominant types of sediments that are in the North American Cenozoic look very terrestrial. Um, they have entirely terrestrial organisms. There aren't mixtures of marine uh, organisms with them. So, for example, I lived in South Dakota for four years in Rapid City, which is not very far from Big Badlands National Park. And Big Badlands National Park is famous for its um, Eocene and Oligocene and um, and into Miocene deposit. These are all Cenozoic units. Um, there's a little bit of Cretaceous down at the bottom in a few areas, what's called the Pure Shale, which is a unit that I worked on elsewhere in South Dakota. It's a black um, marine shale that has mosasaur fossils and plesiosaurs and fish and things like that. Well, there is a transition um, in the Black Hills. Uh, sorry, not in the Black Hills, in the uh, Big Badlands National Park from the Pure Shale to the overlying Cenozoic deposits. And there's a discoloration um, of the pure shale there. It's called the Yellow Mounds area. And they're these very vibrant yellow and reddish orange mound structures that are interpreted as what are called paleosols, uh, ancient um, soil horizons. And I've looked at these things, and you can definitely see this interesting change in coloration going down from the overlying Cenozoic rock units this discoloration in the pure shale until you eventually get down to its normal gray. And you don't see this kind of discoloration kind of anywhere else. This is definitely where there's this kind of unconformity between the two. There's an erosion mark. You've got these mammal bearing units and you've got this deep, what looks to be some sort of deep chemical weathering that has happened to the, to the rock there. Well, the, the sediments that we find uh, these mammal fossils in are part of primarily basinal deposits. They're areas where Sediment seems to be coming in from a couple of different areas in an enclosed low spot. Some of those are quite large and quite broad. Uh, some of them are part of sediments that seem to be starting from the Rocky Mountains and being deposited out towards the east across the, what's now the Great Plains. But a good number of these are fairly basinal and restricted. And that was one of the evidences that was talked about in the 1994 paper about the transition between the flood rocks and into the post-flood rocks that we go from broadly continental, subcontinental to continental level uh, deposition to more restricted and more limited deposition. Uh, the lack of a mixture of terrestrial with marine organisms is also somewhat telling. Now, it could be that this is an entirely terrestrial you know, uh, community that's being deposited, but there's no marine um, below it aside from the pure shale. And again, there's an unconformity there. And there's no marine stuff anywhere above it. It's all just mammal, 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 mammal. It's all terrestrial mammal and lizards and uh, birds and things like that. There's no, you know, any, all of the fish are freshwater types of fish and things like that. So those seem to be a couple of clues as to what's going on. Um, and that the amount, a third evidence was that the, ex, uh, the amount of catastrophism seems to be declining as well. Um, the higher that you get up in the Cenozoic, it seems like less and less of the material is being formed by large scale catastrophes, small scale ones, but not larger scale ones. So it seems that you are, you're gradually dialing down the intensity of things as you move higher and higher up into the Cenozoic. Again, at least in terms of North America, but I think this holds uh, broadly true in a number of other areas um, as well, where we have good record at least uh, to judge. So there, there were a few things then. Moving forward, uh, we find that there was continued discussion of this. Uh, John Whitmore and Mike Oward had a, a long forum discussion in the journal of Cre what's now the Journal of Creation uh, back in 2008 over the Green River Formation. So the Green River Formation um, is a fairly extensive but still regional uh, deposit that is most famous for fish fossils. You go into any rock shop, uh, any museum, natural history museum in the United States, and you will find these little 
you know, pale tan rocks with these bright orange fish on them. They're all coming from Wyoming and nearby areas from the Green River Formation. Uh, John, the Green River Formation is Eocene, so it's part of the Cenozoic, it's part of the tertiary. And uh, John Whitmore worked on fossils from the, the uh, Green River Formation during his uh, PhD work. He created a model of um, exploding fish in his own lab under different columns of water so that he could try to figure out uh, at what depth you ended up with different levels of blown apart fish in the modern world and use that as an analog to understand the depths of the water in different places in the Green River Formation, because sometimes the fish are beautiful and pristine and they're all just right there. Other times their heads are blown out. Other times their whole body is kind of just blown to pieces. And that's because gases build up in the body and eventually rupture the fish. And that happens at shallow water, not at depth. And so he was able to say, we can figure out where the margins of the Green River formation are on the basis of the fish, because all the blown up fish are in this big ring around the Green River formation, which corresponds well to the edges of a lake, uh, rather than the edges of, of maybe some little pool that is bounded by high points during the flood, which is the argument that Mike Goward was, was making about the Green River formation, is that it's still in the flood. It just happens to have topographic highs around it, and so it's a, a limited area. And uh, John Whitmore is saying, no, we've got uh, all terrestrial types of organisms in the Green River Formation. There are freshwater fish, there's mammals, there's birds, there's palm leaves and things like that. This does not look like a marine terrestrial mixture. This looks like a very terrestrial environment. So in 2000, you know, we got 1994, a couple of things happening. By 2008, we've got a big discussion going on uh, because of, you know, continuing papers in the in between. And, you know, I found that to be uh, quite interesting. There were a couple of papers in the ICC in that year of 2008 that dealt with um, flood boundary issues. Um, John Whitmore and Kurt Wise had a paper on uh, looking at the post flood mammal, sorry, the post flood mammalian diversity in the Green River Formation. So. Uh, they were looking at that, and there was another argument that they were presenting that the Green River looks like a post-flood lake. And um, I, having been only briefly out to the Green River Formation, I, I can't adjudicate that uh, for myself. Uh, but what I can say is that everybody I know who has, within creationism who's worked in the Green River Formation, and this would include John Whitmore, Leonard Brand, uh, Art Chadwick, uh, and several others, uh, primarily folks from Loma Linda University. Uh, if they're young earth creationists, they have all concluded that the Green River Formation is post-flood. That, I think, should tell us something. I, th I think that's a considerable bit of evidence um, that should cause those who want to hold to a high post-flood boundary a, a good bit of pause. Uh, these are folks who have spent their time in the field mapping out this stuff, going to the society meetings. I mean, John, John Whitmore is always at the Green River Formation papers. Uh, so is Leonard Brand and R. Chadwick and, and others that are in there. So when those of us within creationism who have spent the greatest amount of time looking at something are consistently coming up with a perspective on something like the Green River Formation, I, I think that should tip the scales uh, in our favor. It, it might not, right? You know, there, there's other arguments to be made out there, but I do think that that is quite telling. So, so just to try and sort of encapsulate what you've said so far then marcus what what you're really saying is that around this boundary that you think is the flood post flood boundary the kpg there seems to be a transition a change in the nature of the sediments that are being deposited so you're starting to see and the fossils so you're starting to see these more terrestrial sediments terrestrial fossils lake sediments uh and you're seeing also a change in the intensity and scale of catastrophism that things seem to be more geographically um, con confined uh, rather than these very broad flood deposits that cover whole continents. So you're, you're seeing things that are confined to smaller basins. So uh, have we got that right so far? That's basically the summary. To clarify a little bit maybe when i was talking about say the pure shale so the pure shale is this mm -hmm. immense marine deposit that's up to 450 meters thick in some places so yeah that that's really big and it extends from easily manitoba uh 
uh, all the way down through, uh, it has correlations down into Texas, but it's certainly being found all the way down through into, say, New Mexico uh, and over across to uh, Minnesota. So it's this huge kind of swath down the, the central United States, the, the, the near west United States, whereas the Green River Formation is occupying a certain you know corner portion of Wyoming and nearby Utah and Colorado, right? It, that's a much much smaller geographic area con- uh, compared to the vast uh, location of the Pier Shale. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, so did did you want to sort of move on to some of the paleontology arguments as well? Because I know that's something that you've uh, particularly focused on in in the publications that you've you've written. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Um, so my work started uh, with some conversations that uh, John Whitmore and I were having with Mike Oward over lunch uh, one time at a uh, Origins meeting uh, back in 2010, I think it was. Uh, and both John and I had brought up to, to Mike that if you put the post-flood boundary very high, like right underneath the Ice Age, a big problem that you're going to run into is that there are genera of mammals in North America that are found on both sides of this boundary. And that would mean that if the end of the flood is right before the Ice Age, and you've got these mammals, they would have been destroyed during the flood. Members of each of those genera would have to be brought on board the Ark in order for them to return back to North America uh, and be found as fossils again. And the more frequently that sort of thing happens, the less and less likely um, it, it really becomes. So let's say that we've got a horse fossil um, of, of a particular genus. Um, and, and we'd be talking about something like Pliohippus, okay, the, the Pliocene horse. And it's found in North America. Um, if it crosses the Pleistocene boundary, and I'd have to check particularly on, on that one, but just for sake of argument here, it crosses that, that means that Pliohippus would have to be on board the Ark. And then once the Ark lands, Pliohippus would then have to retrace its steps over to North America uh, and be buried and uh, killed and buried and made fossils in some post-flood events in order for us to have both flood and post-flood fossils of Pliohippus with the boundary in between. And I, I knew from my background in paleontology, I had had a six credits of, uh, of graduate work in the Cenozoic mammal record. It was, it was a brutal set of classes. It was pretty awful. There's books about this stuff so that you don't have to have classes like I took, but nonetheless, I took the class. And I knew that this was something that actually hap- would have happened with some frequency, and so did John Whitmore. So uh, in talking with Mike about this, I decided that my next year's um, presentation at Origins, that would be the, the first actual Origins conference in Rapid City in 2011, was going to be on looking at the upper post-flood boundary argument and looking for how many boundary crossing mammal genera we just might have. I didn't know the answer, uh, but I suspected that it would be rather high. And then in 2012, I published a paper in Journal of Creation uh, documenting this particular case. Uh, And the argumentation, as as I mentioned, is, is that it would seem very, very unlikely to have many individuals from p- flood sediments return back to their continent of deposition uh, in the post-flood world. This question can be asked whether you think there's been catastrophic plate tectonics or not, because uh, there are still some in creationism who are skeptical of catastrophic plate tectonics. But it's even worse kind of in a catastrophic plate tectonics view because North America might not have been in the same place certainly wasn't in the same place. So you would have had to have had organisms that were buried in a, um, in a latitude, for example, uh, that might be somewhere around the tropics, and then later on are buried again in North America over top of the same deposits, but this time now they're at a high mid-latitude. And you go, well, that seems very strange. They're not even coming back to the same environment or ecosystem. The post-flood world is wildly different from the pre-flood world. Why would these animals come back? So this becomes kind of a probabilistic difficulty on two levels. Uh, first off, from just looking at how many organisms would have to kind of go there and back again uh, to pull a, a, a Tolkien-esque uh, sort of art, uh, statement there. But also by focusing on genera, uh, 
And I looked at 303 genera from a variety of large mammal classes, uh, large mammal groups. Um, not all the mammals. I didn't do rodents, for example. I didn't do bats. Um, I didn't do um, insectivores. So I stayed away from some of the small ones, in part because most of what we have for their record are small bits of teeth and bone, which could be reworked into mm -hmm. overlying sediments. So I wanted to focus on, broadly speaking, some of the bigger animals because it's much harder to rework their stuff without obvious telltale signs. Um, you can get full skeletons of horses and camels and bovids and rhinos and whatnot. So I looked at 303 uh, genera from 28 different families. And what I found is that only one family didn't have a boundary crossing genus, and that was the rhinocerotids. Uh, uh, they were the only ones that seemed to have gone completely extinct by the end of the boundary. Every other family had at least one genus that came back to North America. Um, now, that might be okay if it was only one genus per family. You might be able to make the argument, well, that was the one kind, uh, one member of the kind that was brought, and it came back. But the trouble is, is that you've got several families where this happens with multiple genera. Uh, just to pull uh, pull up my table over here, um, for example, um, one of the ones that I focused on in the paper was the antelocaprids. These are the pronghorn antelopes. They're indigenous to North America. We have no record of them in any other locality in the world. Um, and there are 17 antelocaprid genera throughout the tertiary of, of North America. And four of these would cross a high post-flood boundary. So if we drew that boundary about at the Pliocene Pleistocene, we've got four boundary crossing taxa. We have five different camels uh, that cross the post-flood boundary in North America that are North American genera. Um, and when it comes to the carnivores, we have like nine felids. It's a lot of different cats. That's particularly problematic um, because a good number of these felids um, are even living genera. Uh, like the lynx and felis and um, uh, one of the other large South, uh, North and South American cats, which are known to be interfertile, um, at least to be connected via a network of fertility. So this would mean that in order for us to, to bring aboard um, these different genera, it means that Noah would have to bring a bunch of interfertile cats to represent different kinds that can mate with one another, which doesn't comport with what we think about with kinds. Uh, one of the classic ways of identifying kinds from Frank Marsh was, if animals can interbreed with one another, they are part of the same kind. Um, so anyway, my, my analysis showed that out of the 300 plus genera that I looked at, 23% of them crossed a potentially high post-flood boundary. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. That is not what um, has been expected of the paleontological record transitioning from the flood to the post-flood period. Numerous authors, um, including Mike Oward, Taz Walker, uh, Kurt Wise, I mean, across the, across the spectrum, probably going back to Whitcomb and Morris, I'd have to, to check, have all said that there should be a pronounced break in the paleontology. There should be a break in the fossil record between the things that are flood and the things that are not flood. And what we find if we put the flood boundary very high is that there is widespread continuity. A quarter of the specimens, uh, species, or not species, but genera that we're looking at, cross this boundary, and they cross the boundary not just in random continents, but on the continent in which they were found as fossils below and above. So we don't find some situation where like an African cat finds its way in North America, uh, and those are the records that we have. Instead, if there's a cat in Africa and it crosses the boundary, it crosses the boundary in Africa, and maybe is also in Asia. But we don't find something in South America in the flood, and then in Africa in the post-flood world. So the biogeography of these fossils matches when you go from the Pliocene into the Pleistocene. So my conclusions were that this would make... Um, that boundary untenable. So I just want to clarify um, what exactly. I'm trying to put this into some simpler, simpler words for people to to think about. So your argument basically is, um, you know, if you have a flood boundary in a particular location, then 
what you're looking for is sort of a completely randomized or scrambled fossil record from what was coming before. Because if the ark lands and the animals are getting off and they're going off to wherever they live and decide to live, then I would expect, or maybe everyone would expect, that that would just sort of be random, sort of hit and miss. And you find a climate you like and, and there's food, then you're, you're good. You stay there. And if you put the flood boundary high, as you say, then what you end up having is a bunch of animals, like a quarter that you would, that you would say. They happen to move into places where underneath the, the ground, beneath them, are all the dead bodies of their relatives from before the flood. And they don't know they're there. They can't sense that they're there. There's no climate reason that they should go there because the climate's different. But they just happen to move there, which is a really startling and surprising coincidence. Is that is that basically how this is working here? Yeah, yeah, yeah that okay. sums it up very well. Yeah, all right. And I and I guess it's not even where their dead ancestors uh, were living before the flood necessarily. It's where they just happened to be buried. Oh yeah, right. during the flood. Yeah, yeah, which makes it kind of even weirder um, <laughs> in in some ways. So. So that yeah, so so we've I think we've understood this argument. I hope our listeners have sort of understood the argument too. Um, I guess the next question though is, what happens when you look at the boundary that you prefer? Because yeah. your argument so far is kind of focused on the the upper flood boundary, and you're saying you don't think that works. But what kind of results do you get when you apply this methodology to the boundary that you do prefer? Yeah. And so I was challenged to do that by Kurt, who said, you know, Marcus, nice job, you know, but uh, you didn't actually make an argument for yourself. Um, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, Correct. yeah, I, 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 that's right. That's right. That was a negative argument. Negative arguments are easier, right? They uh, sure are. They, they are, right? Let me show you you're wrong. Well, okay. But what do you do to try and say that you're right? So I investigated then my own perspective on this, the, the KPG boundary. And um, I did this um, for a, I think it was 2014 uh, Origins Conference presentation uh, out when we were in um, Colorado Springs, I think it was. And so I ran the analysis looking at a couple of different data sets, um, did it a little bit differently than I did with the mammals, uh, just because the records are, are not uh, logged in quite the same. Um, and looked at uh, you know the dinosaurs, the uh, bird fossils, uh, what little there were, um, various uh, reptiles and amphibians, uh, crocodilians, uh, pterosaurs, et cetera, and said, okay, looking at the Maastrichtian, that is the, the very last Cretaceous deposits, the classic T-Rex, Triceratops, duck-billed dinosaur horizon, that is an area that has been studied immensely uh, over, over the years. Uh, and it has been the focus of the secular argument of dinosaur extinction. And so there has been scores of teams that have looked over decades and decades uh, at the Hell Creek Formation and the Lance Formation in Wyoming uh, and trying to say, is dinosaur extinction catastrophic or is it a gradual petering out? And they've looked at some other stuff elsewhere. But these are the, these are the classic locations that have the most data. And above the Hell Creek, you have uh, what's called the Tulloch Formation and the Fort Union Formation. These are the, the beginning of the Cenozoic, and the, the Hell Creek is the Cretaceous there. So I took a look at uh, another data set. It included, I think, somewhere around 200-plus uh, genera, so fairly comparable to the mammal set on this one. I think it was about 270 genera. Um, and it turned out that we had about a... 15% crossing rate uh, to it. So substantially lower than the Pliocene Pleistocene, but not zero, right? It, this was not zero. Um, there were a number of things that crossed the boundary there. Uh, there are a number of things that don't. None of the dinosaur fossils cross the boundary at all. There, uh, that's an instance where, yeah, there's been some reworked fossils, but you can see very obviously that they've been reworked. Uh, and they're in in units that show a lot of evidence of compiling stuff from from elsewhere. Um, so you don't have any dinosaurs. Um, 
you lose out a good number of mammals, but not most of your marsupials. The marsupials seem to kind of skate through this fairly well. Um, you lose some of your lizards, but not all of them. The amphibians, your frogs and salamanders, seem to do okay. Uh, your fish do generally all right, as do some of the sharks, uh, the uh, other ones. Crocodilians, a eh, bit of a mixed bag on that one. But when we looked at everything, again, the, the total number was a little less than 15%. I think it was 14.7% for a total crossing rate. Now, that's just looking at the Hell Creek and uh, the Hell Creek Formation, which is a limited geographic area in North America, whereas my initial study of the mammals of North America was the entire continent. So there are some things in other areas um, of North America that we know are Cretaceous and end Cretaceous that don't make it past this boundary that aren't in the Hell Creek. For example, pterosaur fossils are fantastically rare. Um, in the Hell Creek. We have almost none, which is really strange. There's a bunch of them down in Texas in some Mastrichtian units. So we know there are pterosaurs, and we know there's no pterosaurs after the KPG boundary. So if we add in what we do know of the pterosaurs, that drops our number down a little bit. We also know from some material up in Canada that there's a wide variety of bird fossils up there, and they seem to take it pretty bad. Uh, and there's a mass extinction of different bird groups, and that drops the numbers down a little bit as well. When I started factoring in those, which wasn't in the abstract and, and the short paper that was there, uh, but when I was discussing those, that's bringing the numbers down under 10%. Then we get to the question of, well, what about the things that are crossing? They are almost entirely small, really small. So in my mammal paper, I did not include uh, the rodents for example, because of the high potential for reworking uh, and that it's hard to notice the reworking of teeth because the enamel is so strong, even when fossilized, that it's hard for you to tell whether or not this fossil of a tooth really belongs in this rock or was exhumed and redeposited in another one. Well, similarly, the sediments that overlie the Hell Creek constantly carve into and channel the Hell Creek and exhume materials and redeposit them. So it's entirely possible that a bunch of the small uh, frog and lizard things um, and some of the mammals that make it through could actually be Maastrichtian fossils that have made their way into tertiary sediments. And we wouldn't know that they are because we almost have, we have basically no full skeletons anyway of these things. So it's going to be really, really hard to pick up reworking in this case, where it's a lot easier to see reworking if it's in the large-bodied animals, be they dinosaurs or mammals. So when we're looking at the large-body animals, I would say that the, the crossing rate is well under 10% uh, for that, in the um, uh, probably approaching something like five. And now you're getting towards random chance, uh, I, would, I would think, on this. So... I did run a, an analysis. I never wrote a full paper of it, but you know, a 700-word abstract or so for origins and the KPG boundary, at least in North America, looks a lot better uh, than a high post-flood boundary. We have very, very little that's crossing the boundary uh, in comparison, and a lot of it, I think, is potentially explicable. Now, that being said, it would be incumbent upon me and others to actually go out to the Hell Creek and the Tulloch Formation and try and see if there is evidence of reworking of some of these mammal groups, especially if they only make it into the next two rock units. If they're going up into the Eocene, then I'm going to consider these to be solid boundary crossing. You have an example of that with champsosaurs. Uh, these are kind of crocodilian-ish looking things, and champsosaurs are found from the Cretaceous all the way into the Eocene and, and uh, whatnot. So they're, they're one of the counterpoints to this. But it's basically you're looking at like one or two genera versus all the other major large body genera that aren't doing this. And champsosaurs are at least semi-aquatic. Um, they're, they're living in rivers, lakes, streams. Are they taken on board the ark? Probably, I would think so. But there's also a potential argument that these are water creatures and wouldn't have to be represented. So they could potentially, you know, find themselves in North America, survive some of the deposition and get to land and start thriving in the post-flood world. So I think there's a couple of good potentials here, and you don't have those same potential um, ex explanatory 
options when you're dealing with the mammal record and a high post flood boundary. Sure. That's very interesting. Um, Todd, do you do you have any questions before we kind of move on? No, I think we're kind of, I think we're almost yeah. near the end of this episode. Um, we are, we yeah, are. Yeah. Marcus, is is there anything important that we've kind of missed out here before we kind of come just to our closing section of this episode? So one other person who's been doing a lot of work <clears throat> in this um, at, at the same time, and actually more after I, I made my initial uh, contributions on this has been Chad Arment, uh, who's a biologist. And his first paper was in 2024, <laughs> Uh, a short paper with a very profound argument, and that is uh, one of of hybridization. He was asking the question, okay, if two animals are part of the same created kind and they can hybridize, so we're using that criterion. If then we have two, he was looking at snakes. If we have two genera of snakes within the same kind that hybridize, what what might be the flood boundary implicated uh, if we trace their fossil record down, because if they can hybridize, there are post-flood variants on this. And so he says, basically, if we trace back downward through the rock record and we find their genera as fossils, we have to go back until we find only one to potentially get to the post-flood kind that was released. And so he looked at a couple of different snake genera and then looked at their fossil record and said, we have to go past the Pliocene, so that high post-flood boundary, got to go past that. We have to go past the Miocene and at least go down to the Oligocene. These are all different layers within the tertiary uh, to get to a place where we have only one of these hybridizing snakes. And so he proposed then that the Oligocene would be a minimal post-flood boundary. Not that it necessarily was the actual post-flood boundary, but you have to go at least that far back in order to account for uh, the hybridization ca capabilities within a particular family of snakes. Uh, the, he was looking at the colubrid uh, snakes in particular. So it was a, a short paper in the Journal of Creation. It's like three or four pages at, at most, uh, but really a, an interesting approach to it, taking a biological question and then you know backing it through the paleontological record. In a similar type of argument that I made for mammal fossils in North America, Chad Arment goes and takes a look at Australia, right, which has a really weird group of animals, all of these marsupials that are endemic. So I had mentioned the anilocaprids, the pronghorns in North America as an endemic group, but a lot of North American families are also found in Asia and other places. The genera are different, but nonetheless, the families are the same. You don't get that with Australia. Instead, with Australia and South America that Arment looks at as well, you get these very, very isolated populations that are different from everywhere else in the world. And he then goes on to also calculate out what are the probabilities of all of these animals uh, dying and being buried in Australia and then coming back again. And the percentages, the, the probabilities are so fleetingly low that, um, you, you know, we don't have names for these kinds of numbers. You know, they're 10 to the minus 38, uh, you know, and things like that. So he runs a statistical argument and says that statistically, it's just impossible uh, for a post-flood boundary to be high uh, in these areas. So likewise, it's a negative argument, uh, but he's look now looking at two different continents. So we've got three continents that we've looked at, uh, a Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary, and we keep running into the same problem. And, and as I've looked at compilations of, um, of books on Australia, on Africa, uh, there's a, a, another fairly recent one on Asia, this pattern just keeps showing up again. And that's one of the things that uh, you, you mentioned, that we want to pr produce a, a positive model building sort of thing. So one of those things that we have to do is we have to look for consistent patterns. And a consistent pattern seems to be that there is a continual decrease in catastrophism, a continual decrease in the extent of particular deposition, an increase in terrestriality, uh, to the fossil record, more and more terrestrial only mammals. And the places where you find marine stuff are all on the margins. You find whale fossils in North America, sure, but you find them, you know, here in Virginia, where I live, out east of Richmond. You've got to get out to the coastal plain before you find any fossils of whales. Uh, if you find them in Georgia, you're finding them in the really shallow, low lying lands that until recently were still covered with water. 
So um, between Arment's work um, and my own, um, the biological and the um, and the paleontological arguments seem to be meshing very nicely. So in looking at the KPG boundary, I think that we've got a lot of good evidence that there is that strong biostratigraphic break. Is it as strong as I would like it to be? No, but it might be better than I think it is. Um, and, and I think that's given, you know, that gives us some good cause to be optimistic about looking at the KPG boundary. Um, it does mean that we have other kinds of challenges. We've got to explain a lot of still very catastrophic activity and some fairly widespread deposits in the post-flood world. But again, they're not nearly the same order of magnitude. They're one or two orders of magnitude down from what I think we're looking at in the flood rocks. That, that's very helpful. Um, and, and thank you for sort of setting that out for us, Marcus. And we'll, we'll put links to some of those papers that you've referred to in the show notes as well for everybody. Uh, just as we kind of wrap this up, just, just very, very briefly, and I think you've kind of touched on it there, what would you say are some of the big challenges for the position that you hold? What are some of the big unanswered questions? What do you think are the strongest arguments maybe, you know, that, that people who advocate a different flood boundary position have and that you, that you feel you don't have good answers to just now? Yeah, you know, in creationism, there's no shortage of areas where we don't have good answers for things, um, or at least not yet. And uh, that's true with the post-flood boundary. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty strong advocate for putting it at the KPG. Um, that said, it doesn't mean that uh, I think all the ducks are lined up in a row here. Um, one of the main arguments, and I think a, a valid one, is what do you do with the mammals? How come there's no mammals in the fossil record you know, of, of contemporary types of mammals? Because if the KPG boundary is, is where the flood is, then contemporary mammal families and the many mammal families in the Cenozoic that don't even reach uh, contemporary times are not flood. Uh, so where on earth are the mammals? And uh, I, I could hear uh, Morris, you know, from Whitcomb and Morris <laughs> thinking like, are you nuts? You know, what are you doing getting rid of all of this stuff? Uh, how do you explain uh, fossilization in the post-flood world? Well, I think local catastrophes can do that. So I think we can, we can table that one. But the mammal question and some of the other things that go along with it are, is, that's a big one. Uh, that's a problem. Um, Tim Clary has brought up a very strong argument against this in the local Ararat area and saying that the entire Ararat region, the, the whole kind of area of Turkey, is still underwater uh, in, uh, in the, uh, much of the Cenozoic. So not only just KT, but even further along, it's not until much later do you get um, the mountains of Ararat showing up in the later tertiary. So where is he going to land the boat? Um, I've looked at some of the, the maps and I've looked at some of the cross sections of the area. He's making a good argument. I have noted that there are some conglomeratic um, deposits. These are area, uh, conglomerates or sedimentary rocks that tend to have uh, cobbles, boulders, pebbles, and things like that. And they tend to indicate uh, high energy and near source locations. Uh, rocks have to tumble their way down from someplace. There are a, a few um, isolated conglomerate beds in those areas, indicating that there's some highlands nearby around the KT boundary, uh, the KPG boundary, but they're, they're not extensive. So right now it's kind of like, well, maybe I can put a thumbtack there for the Arc to land, but, but it's, it, it seems to like go underwater for a little while and they go up. That doesn't seem to be all that, um, all that likely. Uh, so I face a challenge uh, on that one, and that is a challenge that has not been met, uh, to my knowledge, by any of the uh, adherents for uh, a low post-flood boundary like myself. So I think that's a live, uh, a live criticism that we have to yet deal with. Um, so those, those would be two that I would say big challenges. Uh, what do we yeah. do with, with where to put the ark, and what do we do with all the mammals? But again, I would come back to, I think these are mechanistic problems to be answered rather than existential ones. And placing the kind at the genus as one has to, again, means that you're going to have, in the end, probably tens of thousands of different animals. I mean, like hundreds of, actually, you're going to be dealing with hundreds of thousands of animals that have to go on board one arc. And there is just isn't space for that. Uh, in contrast, when I uh, did a full analysis uh, with a, a student at Liberty University, on arc kinds, if the family is the level of the kind, and we're bringing along terrestrial organisms, uh, we have 
you know, somewhere around 2,000 animals that have to go on the ark. We've got a, a little over 900 and some odd families. So there's room on the ark for that. But if you think that uh, the average family in the fossil record has probably got something like four or five genera, um, then all of a sudden you are increasing that by half an order of magnitude. But the large number of ruminant um, clean animals means that you've got to put seven or seven pairs of those on, and that becomes an arc of its own, never mind what you need for the others. So, um, and, and you run into these statistical improbabilities and unlikelihoods. So, I think those count as stronger evidence against a high post flood boundary than some of the geological arguments count against a low flood boundary. Marcus, thanks so much again, you know, for spending time with us today. Um, you know, covering some of that that material for us. Um, it's been very helpful. I hope our viewers and listeners have found these last two episodes really helpful to hear from um, proponents of, of different views on the flood post-flood boundary. And uh, next time, I think what we're going to do, Todd, is you and I are going to have a discussion and give some of our own um, reflections on the things that we've heard and, um, and, and talk about that. So right. uh, I'm looking forward to that and I hope our listeners are too, and that you'll join us again uh, in a couple of weeks time. Okay. We'll see you then. All right. See you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.